Time to get this old girl back on the air. In every Chevrolet showroom across America, more and more people are looking at the car that's just out and just wonderful. The 1957 Chevrolet. Some are looking at Chevrolet's daring new front-end styling. Good day, folks. Welcome back to Mike's Radio Repair and Restoration. If you're enjoying our series of videos, maybe you could like and subscribe. That would be really great if you could support our community. Well, today we're going to start uh, getting this old Johnson Viking 2 all uh, finished up, cleaned up, some modifications, and back on the air. So the history with this unit was is I bought it a year ago. I actually bought three of them all together for $300, which was a, a good deal, I think. Um, one of them was near complete, but had some issues. One of them is missing some knobs, which isn't a big deal. I think I can find them, and I think I can restore it. The unit's unrestored. And the last one was all cut into pieces, and I got the chassis and all the bits and parts. So I really got two nearly complete radios, or one complete radio, one nearly complete radio, and one for parts. So that's quite handy to have that. So I hope to get through the restoration of this one and then move on to the second one. This one's going to be a test bed for some modifications I'm doing. Um, this one here was the kit form, and the other one that I've got that's missing a couple of knobs was the factory built one. And although the cases on these are a little bit beat up, they were disrespected and dragged around in somebody's basement for a long period of time. Um, the chassis are actually very clean. There's no rust. It's just a little bit of dust and dirt. They'll clean up very nicely. So to date, last spring, I would say it was, I started working on this unit, and I actually got it transmitting. Um, but it would, there was no modulation. And uh, it had the typical Johnson problem. It happens with the Viking and the Ranger where the interstage audio transformer dies. And that is uh, a corrosion issue inside that transformer. And I've got one here. This is the original that I took out. Um, there's a, some kind of an insulative corrosion issue that, uh, that takes them out. So that's an unfortunate failure, but the fortunate part is, is I have aftermarket ones to put in, and that's what I've installed in this one. If anybody needs one, if any, anybody's got a Ranger that won't modulate because his transformer's dead, or a Viking 2, drop me a line and I can hook you up. So that's kind of handy. So I installed that, and I actually got it modulating, but there was a lot of distortion, and uh, that all came from the first two... Uh, audio stages, resistors, and capacitors were bad. And, of course, I went through and replaced all those. So I uh, changed some of the caps in the power supply just very quickly, just tagged them in place. Um, other things that I did rather quickly just to get it up and working. I like to prove that a set is going to go, going to get up and working and that all the iron and transformer are, are okay. And then I'll go back and i clean it up. So this is the stage I'm at now is we're going to, we're going to clean this radio up. Uh, I know it works. I know it modulates. Um, I put in two new 6146s. I put in two new 807s in the modulator stage. Uh, everything else looks to be all right. This has actually got a factory um, uh, grid keying system in it, um, which is kind of nice. Uh, it's very well built and nicely installed. So... Uh, We'll be cleaning all that stuff up, cleaning up the chassis, and I have to take all the case off it to clean up all the knobs and the roller inductors and the, the wafer switches and all that, and there's a, uh, a dial cord in here that needs to be replaced. So those are all the telemetry things that I have to do. But insofar as modification, I'm going to go through it with schematics in a minute. Um, the original Viking 1 had a 4D32 final tube in it. But the modulator was the same as this. It was, you know, a couple of 807s and a class AB1 uh, configuration. And with the 4D32 and those 807s and that type of a design, 
linearity worked good and you could get 100% modulation and it made a nice trapezoid uh, pattern when you put it to the test. But when they put the 6146 pair in it, um, it has the typical tetrode linearity kink issues that tetrodes tend to have. But they brought the modulator design forward from the Viking 1, and that doesn't allow this set really to make 100% clean linear modulation. And, and there's a modification for that. Um, a lot of people try to correct it in the audio stages, and that's not where the problem is. You know, that's like one of my acquaintances says it's like changing your tires because your brakes don't work. So. I, I, I hear them loud and clear on that uh, thing. The best thing to do is fix it at the source, and the source is with the screen voltage. And there's a modification that's tried and true out there. I've not done it yet, so this is going to be my first, but several people that I trust have done it, where there's uh, a change of one large resistor and uh, an addition of another large resistor that controls the screen voltage. Um, so the screens will get a, a, a mix of, a nice balanced mix of modulated and unmodulated high voltage. And with this, it brings us the ability to have 100% modulation with very nice linearity. Now, when you do that, um, there's a couple of other mods you have to deal with. Um, the power supply, the high voltage power supply, I think it's got an eight or nine, eight or nine microfarad um, big filter can in it, and it's really not enough. So we need to change the dynamic impedance of the high voltage power supply to be able to keep up with this new level of modulation. And so that's changing that as simple as just addition of a few more capacitors to give it the, uh, the headroom uh, to peak when it wants to. Um, and then the last part of that change is uh, uh, kind of a safety feature is now that you can potentially go into overmodulation and splatter, uh, we can put a negative cycle clipper in um, that's going to protect the modulation transformer because when the 6146 goes all the way negative, um, it can create quite a current issue for the, uh, for the modulator uh, modulation transformer. So we're going to put a, a clipper in there that should you drive it into over modulation, the clipper kicks in and protects that transformer. So this is not unusual that you do one modification and two or three more modifications have to follow suit. So uh, this is a tried and true mod. And like I said, people who have done it, um, I trust. And I've seen the results, so uh, it looks real good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that and use this as a test bed here. Um, so once we get that done, there's a couple of little changes. There's a few small components that we're going to change in the audio stages to give it a nice, bright, clean audio. Now, there's a lot of AM guys out there who like broadcast quality, and they'll sit on 80 meters or 40 meters and choose us out with local guys which is great, and the audio sounds wonderful, you know. Um, this, the uh, the audio bandwidth will be limited to about 6 kilohertz, and it'll have it'll have a pleasing audio, but it won't certainly won't be broadcast quality, but it will, what it will have is what I call communication punch. It's the same when we did the DX60. The DX60, there's endless modifications you can do it, uh, do to it to uh, increase the, the fidelity of it or make it more broadcast audio-ish, if you will as well as deleting the uh, carrier control AM. And none of those I did because I prefer, especially with the DX60 running only 60 watts, um, to have communications grade punch audio. So we're going to have that. It may be a little bit better with this, a little bit pleasing audio, certainly with a D104. So those are the modifications I got to get done, and we're going to go through them all. I'm going to go through them with a schematic in a minute. You know, plus taking it apart, cleaning it up, cleaning all the way for switches, and uh, uh, just generally getting this old girl back on the air. So I'm really looking forward to this. This is my personal transmitter uh, that I look forward to uh, getting on the air with in, in a few weeks or a month. Uh, um, I think it's a good project to do now and uh, get ready. I guess uh, a lot of people uh, 
do the radio hobby in the winter and when the springtime comes they kind of sort of forget about radio and uh and go off and do spring summer things and uh so i'm going to get a bunch of stuff i've got to get some new antennas up and whatnot and uh we'll get this ready uh for next year maybe we'll be able to use it through the summer when the band conditions are good i know i was just trying to listen into some of the 40 meter nets today and the the band conditions with the uh, extended uh, um, sunlight is uh, aren't very good right now. So let's take a look at the schematic and some of the changes we're going to do, and uh, you can see uh, what direction I'm going to go. So we'll look at those schematics next. Okay, here is the Viking 2 up on the screen. Let's, uh, let's kind of see if we can... Zoom in on the modulator here. And here we have it here. A couple of 807s. Um, this is the uh, interstage audio transformer that likes to burn out. Um, I just want to add uh, something to the uh, to this here. There are two on the market that are available. One, the one that I've got, and there's another one made by Hammond. The Hammond one in my opinion, really muddies the speech. Um, it tries to make the modulator do things it's not designed to do with low frequencies. And, and it, as a result, I find it quite muddy. Um, so I stay away from it. The one that I am using uh, maintains fairly close audio characteristics to the uh, original one. So uh, that's what we want to stay with. <clears throat> but anyways, if you're following along and you're going to do any of these mods, remember you do so at your own risk. Not only have you got a 300 volt supply here, you've got a 600 volt supply, and I'm sure more than 300 milliamps, which if you get into the wrong situation can seriously harm you, or certainly 600 volts at 300 milliamps can absolutely be fatal. So remember folks, you're following along at your own risk. So we take a peek at the modulator here, and now let's uh, let's have a look at the uh, modulator for the VK1. This is the Viking one here. Try to blow it up a little bit, and essentially, apart from a few small component changes, it's the same ordeal, the same design. And in the Viking one, they used a single 4D32 final tube, and this combination worked. Um, you know, you had good good level of modulation and a good level of linearity. So, when I talked about changing a couple of resistors, I'm talking about 28. We change R28 to a 40K resistor, 20 watt, and we're going to add another resistor, uh, a 60K 20 watt. Let me just pull that poor drawing I made up here. Do, 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 do. See if I can blow this up a bit here now. So there's R28 has been changed to 40k and that's a 20 watt resistor so it's a big resistor. And now we've added, you can see my little arrows here, another resistor R28B I've called it which is a 60k which comes up from the 600 volt uh, power supply. So we get a balance of uh, modulated and unmodulated power to the screens on the 6146s, which solves the linearity and solves the, the, the modulation level. Um, now, like I had said earlier, we have to do some other things to protect the uh, modulation transformer. Now that you can overmodulate it, you need to do something about it. So let's have a look at that. Alrighty, so here's my drawing and the changes to the limiter. Uh, change, here's the modulation transformer, and this is it. There are 4,007, one, one end 4,007 diode stacked with a 3K 10 watt resistor, just like this. And this prevents negative cycle loading. Let me get another drawing here now. Oh, here we go. Hope I'm not making you all dizzy out there. Now that you can over modulate plate mod, you know, the final plate modulation at 100% modulation um, has a 
possibility to clip ground, um, which puts a tremendous load on the uh, on the modulation transformer. The, the modulation transformer is looking for 2,500 to 3,000 ohms uh, kind of an input impedance type of a scenario uh, or, or load, if you will. So when we hit ground, the diodes begin to conduct and it turns that resistor on and it puts that 3 K um, load back on the uh, modulation transformer. So it really is very protective. Now it doesn't stop the clipping, but what it does do, it's just a protection for the modulation transformer because with this all set, that's the last thing you'd want to do is burn out that uh, burn out that transformer. So let's just go here now. What else are we going to look at now? We have to change the, like I said, the dynamic impedance of the of the main power supply, and here's how we're going to do it. And this is the original. Uh, let me just make this a little bigger here. Um, this is C9. This is the original eight microfarad large can capacitor that uh, is installed on the set. So we're going to add two 33 microfarad capacitors at 450 volts in series. We're going to cross them up with 470k 2 watt resistors as a balancing resistor. When capacitors are stacked like this across the power supply um, in series, this is going to equate to a 900 volt tolerance rating and about 16 and a half microfarads of additional capacity. So we're going to have, um, you know, so like 24. Uh, microfarads uh, in total in the power supply of filtering caps and they these will provide the dynamic impedance um, and supply needed for the 100% uh, uh, modulation uh, mod that we're going to do so let's let me have a C here now is there anything else I haven't showed you yet I don't think so I think that pretty much covers that so let's take a little bit of a tour around the set and uh, get familiar with what's going on. Okay. First thing we'll notice is that it's not a rusty mess. Transformers are nice and clean. There's no real corrosion. It's just dusty and dirty. It'll be easy to clean up and be very pretty in the end, which is always very nice. So um, at least I know it's been kept dry. So right off the bat, this is the uh, grid block keying uh, factory kit from Johnson. It's uh, all been all nicely installed and it operates quite well. Um, it improves the uh, the key note quite a bit. Uh, so that's a kind of a handy mod and it works well. So let's take a tour around here up front. We have the oscillator section and the selector. Um, we also down the bottom here have uh, the socket for uh, crystals. Now I have the uh, 122 VFO for this, uh, so uh, you're uh, released from being rock bound and you can wander around the bands pretty good. Um, back here we have the rectifier for the 300 volt line, and we have the finals, the 26146s. Over here we have the rectifiers for the high voltage. So just a note about this, and uh, this is the side we're going to be increasing some capacitance on. We're going from a factory uh, value of 8 up towards 24 or 25. And you might say, well, why don't you go more? Uh, capacitors are cheap, easy, and free in these days, and uh, installing more must be better, take a little bit more ripple out. Well, the problem is, is that when you go into transmit and the high voltage comes on, the uh, inrush current to charge those bigger capacitors may well or likely exceed the inrush current of these uh, rectifier tubes and cause them to flash over. So it's known that at the 24, 25 uh, total microfarad level that we attain the dynamic impedance we want for uh, dealing with the extra peaks of the 100% modulation. Um, we know that we don't exceed the uh, uh, current of these, uh, these rectifiers. So I'm going to stay with that and I think that's pretty important. And over here, we've got our 807s. This is our modulator circuit over here. And in the middle, we've got our uh, our Pi tank here. And I've got uh, I've got one out of the parts here just to show you that on the bottom, there's actually a roller 
inductor here is where a lot of transmitters will have an inductor that's tapped at various places that you switch in and out with a band switch. And in this case, it's a nice roller inductor, which I thought was kind of a nice touch. Kind of mechanically busy, um, but nevertheless, it's a it's an interesting deal. And it's all very, very well built with very nice components. So that's kind of nice. So um, don't see anything else here that we should really look too hard at. Um, let's, uh, let's flip it over and look underneath, shall we? Okay, taking a peek underneath. Uh, just have to add, <clears throat> you wouldn't believe how heavy this thing is. It's, uh, I think this is where the boat anchor name came from, was a uh, set like this. This is a very heavy set. Anyways, right, quick tour on the bottom here. This is the uh, 8 microfarad C9 capacitor here. They go can cab. They usually don't go bad. Um, I will check it to see how, uh, how, it, how it's surviving. Um, this is the interstage audio transformer that I replaced over here. I'm going to get maybe get my red pointer so you can see better. Um, and it bolts right in where the old one was. Um, some of this here needs to be cleaned up. It's been chewed on over the years and whatnot. Uh, so I need to clean it up. And these caps here aren't the final values. These are the uh, caps for the 300 volt supply and caps for the bias supply. They're not the, again, they're not the final value, so I'll be cleaning these up and putting in terminal blocks and whatnot, making this all nice and neat. There are lots of other resistors that need to be looked at, and uh, there's an old tubular capacitor here that's part of the grid block keying system that needs to be changed. So just general cleanup. At this point, like I said, it works, and uh, that was my, my first goal, was to make sure that everything was going to work. Um, another thing that we got to do is we got to put a three-wire cord on it. And these uh, coils here, these are uh, back in the TVI days when uh, uh, manufacturers were working very hard to keep all any parasitic oscillations or any harmonics in the box and uh, not into uh, the power, power system and not out of the antenna. Um, I remember back in the days when everybody had a TV antenna and uh, that TVI was a problem. If you lived in a built-up area and you were... Uh, buggering up your neighbor's TV, it could really create some heat. So um, they sealed this box up very well and uh, and did things like that to try to keep stray RF inside the box uh, rather than in your neighbor's TV. So uh, I guess I'm going to tie it up here. I've got a bunch of parts on order. The uh, resistors for the, uh, for the modulation uh, modification, I think I have these in stock. So Really, the next thing to do is I'm probably going to get these done, probably going to get the dynamic uh, um, impedance change the, of the high voltage supply and put the extra caps in. I'm not sure where I'm going to put them yet, so I've got to dig about and see if I can get them on this back wall here somehow um, where it's safe. Um, but I think uh, we'll tie this video up here. If you've got questions, leave them below for sure. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting project and a nice old transmitter to get up and going. It certainly has a, has a great reputation out there, and uh, there's lots of them around, and uh, you can get pick, pick them up at a hand fest. I have the uh, Viking uh, uh, 122 VFO that matches this. this. This particular box itself is crystal bound, but you can plug the VFO in, and uh, away you go. I've also got the VFO that's uh, also working well. So again, we'll, uh, we'll tie this video up. Um, if you uh, like our series of videos, please subscribe and like if you could. We'd really appreciate it. So until the next one, we'll see you again.